<laughs> okay, so I can't claim credit for this great slide. Uh, my colleague and collaborator, Jerry McDonough, created it. Um, but this is, um, I'm going to be talking, this is a case study. I'm going to be talking about the Preserving Virtual Worlds project, um, PVW1, as we call it was funded from 2008 to 2010 by the Library of Congress. And I'll touch just a little bit on our sister project, the follow-up project, PVW2, which is currently underway. Uh, Jerry McDonough is our fearless leader at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, but this is a multi-institutional project. Project partners are University of Maryland, uh, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and Stanford University, in addition to Illinois. So for this project, we adopted a case set approach. It was a very exploratory project. We were interested in kind of scoping the problem of what it even means to say you're preserving these complex uh, digital artifacts, um, software, complex software. And so the games in our case set, there were eight in all, spanned the years from 1962 to 2003 or thereabouts. Uh, we included a range of genres, um, a lot of interactive fiction. So we had, in our case set, um, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, which is the first documented text adventure game. Um, we had uh, Space War, which dates from 1962 and was originally played on a PDP-1 machine. Um, as far as I know, the only functional PDP-1 machine is at the Computer History Museum uh, over in either, is it Palo Alto or San Francisco? Um, I don't know of any others. The case set also included first-person shooter game Doom. Um, other works of interactive fiction included Mystery House, which was the first work of, work of interactive fiction to include graphics. And you can see how incredibly crude. The, it's, it's actually, Mystery House is that house that you see in the upper, I guess it's your left-hand corner of the screen. And the, the, it was filled with almost sort of stick-like figures. They were vector graphics. Um, I believe that Mystery House was coded in Fortran originally. Um, so, and then Mind Wheel, which another work of interactive fiction that was authored by uh, Robert Pinsky, former poet laureate of the United States. So I'm giving you just some background on the projects first, an overview of sort of what we did. And then I'm going to um, touch on issues of authenticity and trust in the Open Archival Information System. Um, our project was OAS, OAIS compliant, as they say, so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and as I mentioned in the, when we had the, the sort of round table earlier, um, I adopt a very broad and expansive notion of data. Um, so uh, again, artifacts, phenomena, as the, was the term used during the discussion, um, events, actions, uh, ideas, um, as well as things like numbers. So you, can, you all can let me know at the end if what I'm talking about is actually data modeling um, or if it's something else. And also for the archivists in the room, um, uh, if, I, if I get anything wrong about the OAIS system, please just correct me. So I mentioned that PVW was a, an exploratory project some of the problems that we encounter, the challenges while trying to preserve the games in our case set. And by preserve, we actually ingested the, the bits into institutional repositories at Stanford University and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, and, and, uh, and created informa information packages. Those are what live now in those repositories. Um, but things we, challenges we encountered were things like platform obsolescence, and you actually see the PDB, PDP-1 machine that I just referenced a minute ago there. Um, the, the technologies are simply, um, you know, have entered the, the stage of oblivion. Um, things like software dependencies, so when you run, uh, you know, a game like um, Mind Wheel on your computer, it's, it's hard to determine what the boundaries of the object are that you're preserving because there's so many software dependencies. So um, the, the, the computer program that is MindWheel will depend on the code li libraries supplied by the operating system that are shared across different programs. So that presents an enormous obstacle. Um, things like intellectual property law, 
Uh, this was huge in the case of, for example, Second Life. Second Life was in our case set, um, the only 3D virtual world in our case set, which dates from 2003. Um, oh, there it goes. <laughs> see the Twitter thing going up. Um, so, um, so, so Second Life, if you might know, if you've ever been in Second Life, that, um, that residents of the world uh, have, can claim intellectual property on the artifacts they create. So we weren't trying to save all of Second Life. That would have been a, you know, a fool's errand. Um, but instead, we were trying to try to, uh, to to, to grab about three or four different islands in Second Life. So Democracy Island, Stanford University Library's presence in Second Life, um, the International Space Flight Museum in Second Life, and a few others. What we tried to do to, um, to address the IP issues was first uh, take an inventory of all of the different objects on a given island, and then identify the in-world owners of those objects and essentially give them a virtual you know, gift of deed or donor agreement form um, to see if they would be ready, uh, willing to sign it to allow us to, to grab their content. Um, this failed miserably. Uh, the best case scenario was one of the islands, I think we get, got a 10% response rate, and on one or two of them we got you know, no responses at all. So, and there were enormous technical problems on top of that. Um, it's very hard, you can, it's, it's not that hard to get, um, to grab textures and basic uh, geometry information. There's actually a program called CopyBot, which we use, which was created by Second Life griefers who were stealing people's intellectual property. So we rode on the coattails of the pirates and used their program for our preservation project, which is actually very typical. Um, in fact, one kind of sub-theme here is that everything we do in the realm of, in the realm of digital preservation of video games is, in, uh, is really parasitic, I think, on what the gamers do. Um, they, do they, they do extraordinary things. They build emulators. So very often in the library and information science world, we depend on the emulators created by gamers. They create weird hardware um, to do things like uh, grab, um, grab content off of obsolete storage media, magnetic media. Um, so the, there's one piece called a cryoflux a piece of hardware, it's basically um, a floppy disk controller that allows you to circumvent the original platform or system that's now you know, very hard to come by and, and usually not in functioning order. Um, you, know, like you, you don't have to actually go track down an Apple II or a Commodore 64, whatever it is. You can simply use this cryoflux that's hooked up to um, a floppy drive, which you can still find, and it, and it doesn't, again, have to be a floppy drive from the original system and then it's connected with a USB cable to a modern PC. Um, the software on the hardware device um, isn't stymied by DRM. Um, it can basically read any format. Um, and so you, you, you just you grab the bits off of the magnetic media and then it's on your, it's, then it's on your modern PC. So they do things like that. Um, they create metadata. Um, and they are very cavalier about IP issues. Um, and one of the interesting things is that they make headway in getting IP um, rights uh, where, we, where we often fail. So, for example, um, there's a lot of gamers who create what's, what's called machinima, which is movies made using game engines. Um, and they, um, this is con considered derivative work, and therefore, technically, you have to get the permission of the copyright holders. They started doing it anyway, um, not asking permission from the game developers. The game developers saw that it boosted their brand value, and they eventually created content usage rules that now give the pirates the, you know, the rights to actually create this work. So the practice of unlawful machinima led directly to the practice of lawful machinima. Um, we experimented with um, different forms of preservation, including um, migration, emulation, and what we sometimes call reenactment. It all goes by other names like recreation and reimplementation. Um, so I won't I won't say too much about this, other than um, uh, maybe I'll just say about emulation. Uh, well, a couple words. Um, so emulation. I think we tend to think of emulation as the equivalent of a kind of facsimile of the original object. And one of the things we did is that with our game set, we tested different emulators. So we would run um, our legacy software in different emulators and compare them. And they actually vary considerably. 
emulator to emulator and how, and the sort of the quality of their rendering. So some emulators might render color better or sound better or what have you. So there's actually a vast degree of difference across different emulators. Um, Reenactment or reimplementation, in our case set we looked at uh, Mystery House, which I mentioned a minute ago, um, which was uh, released into the public domain in 1987, um, but the source code was never released. So in 2004, Nick Monfort, Emily Short, and some others um, recoded or re-implemented Mystery House in the Inform programming language, and it's available as the Mystery House Taken Over project online now. I'm just going to mention briefly um, PVW2. I'm, I'm not going to concentrate very much on it. This is our follow-on project. Our case set, I think there's a sm slightly smaller set of games, I think six, maybe seven. They're mostly educational games. Um, but it's hard to make a case that Doom, Doom, so Doom makes a reappearance in this case set. You can't really make a case that Doom is, a, is an educational game. But we've got Oregon Trail in there, um, Carmen San Diego, uh, Typing of the Dead, which was a game based on a previous ar arcade game, uh, a light gun shooter, a uh, shooter on rails, uh, where you would kill zombies. And Typing of the Dead, um, the, uh, the player characters, um, now walk around with dream, portable Dreamcast machines strapped on their backs and keyboards. And instead of, instead of shooting zombies, they type them to death. So this was seen as a typing game. So the zombies would get words over their heads, and you'd have to type them as fast and as accurately as you could to, to kill or neutralize the zombies. Um, so this project, the first project was really much, much more practical. As I said, at the end of the day, we were trying to ingest bits into repositories. This is really in some ways a more research-oriented project. Our premise is that um, preservation tends to be lossy. You tend to lose information over time. But if you can identify the most significant characteristics of the objects in your custody, then, then you can try to adopt preservation strategies to ensure that those features or characteristics remain intact, even if you lose others. Um, so in Typing of the Dead, for example, um, you know, it, you've really got to, uh, you've really got to preserve the fact that, it's, that it requires a QWERTY keyboard. It doesn't make any sense at all without that. On the other hand, maybe something like um, color depth or, or color tonality is, more of a, is, is a less important feature, so that kind of thing. What the big challenge with this project, there's a number of big challenges with this project, but one that's emerged, I think, um, uh, that looms rather large is that uh, the archival literature on significant properties, and there is a fairly robust literature on this, um, usually define significant properties in a way that suggests their surface features. They, it's often described as the look and feel of the object that you're preserving. So, so features are attributes that you can visually inspect. And in the case of games, you're also interested in the underlying you know, data structures and structural properties. And that's very hard to get at because usually we don't, have, we don't always have the source code. And we, we, in fact, usually don't have the source code. Although for our case set, for some of the games, we did have the source code. Um, and besides that, it's not only about having the source code, it's about understanding the relationship between the underlying game engine and um, the, the expression of the work at the, vis at the visible level. So um, it's, it's something we've been thinking a lot about. Um, we're interested, for example, in um, things like, you know, deep, deep, deep pro uh, sorry, programming debugging tools. Um, that often, you know, that, that uh, programmers use to let them understand the relationship between the underlying code and the behavior of the, the program. So when you see something buggy happening in a software program, how do you trace it back to what's happening in the code? And I'm not a programmer, but, but they have these ty kinds of tools. Um, also, I think you could look at something like um, what the, uh, the, the genomic community is doing. So they have a sort of similar problem where they, they have the genomic layer of data, the sequences of, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the genetic sequence, and then there are, there's also the, that's the genotypic layer, then there's also the phenotypic layer, which is the expression of those genetic sequences at the visual level, the behavioral level. And so they're very interested in trying to map between those two levels, and they've developed all kinds of tools for doing that. Um, and then there's a strong tradition in HCI um, that is about trying to make under, the underlying behavior of systems visible to an end user. 
Um, I think we could learn a lot about this, and I think this ties it back into um, some of the discussion earlier today um, where Wendell was talking about, you know, what features of the underlying data model can we, um, you know, can we shield from the end user because it's simply not necessary for them to know. They might not be interested in knowing it. But the converse of that is that often it can help the end user to actually know something about the underlying data model um, or the game engine or whatever it is. And so again, in, in the HCI field, there's, there's some really interesting work that tries to do that. So making like the behavior of a home network system understandable to the end user. Um, I just saw a fascinating talk about this um, at the iSchool University of Maryland the other week um, where the researcher um, was um, trying to help uh, users see what um, applications consume the most bandwidth, for instance. Um, was it, you know, YouTube or Facebook applications? And then they could also see which members in their household consumed the most bandwidth and other properties of the underlying system. So I, I think it's, I, I would point to this particular issue. Um, what we, what making, uh, uh, making the unseen seen um, as one maybe important aspect of data modeling. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to authenticity um, and trust. So basically, I, I suggested earlier that gamers play an incredibly important role in digital preservation. On the other hand, you, and then you've also got uh, professional archivists and researchers like myself who are trying to save games. And so I'm interested in kind of comparing and contrasting the two models of authenticity that exist in these two communities. They're very different. Um, and I think because the gamers play such a crucial role, there's no reason why both camps can't be, you know, pursuing um, their separate projects and adopting different models of authenticity. But I also think um, kind of uh, building on some of Jeremy John's recommendations around personal digital archiving, that we need to think about a kind of post, supporting a post-custodial model of game preservation where um, these player archivists take primary custom, custody. Uh, we don't take, you know, we don't actually um, acquire um, all of these games ourselves. Uh, but we try to provide services that let them do what they do better. How can we help this community? How can we partner with them? Um, and so understanding how their models of authenticity differ from ours can be useful in that regard. So I have up here the definition of, um, of authenticity that comes from the um, Society of American Archivists Glossary of Archival and Record Terminology. And um, so they define it as the quality of being genuine, not a counterfeit and free from tampering, and is typically inferred from internal and external evidence, including its physical characteristics, structure, content, and context. And I kind of bolded the and free from tampering there, because I think that the OAIS model um, really builds on that facet of authenticity. Gamers, um, by contrast, adopt a, they're, I, they're, they're more sort of um, tolerant of variability, um, so I'll get to that in just a minute. In fact, here's a couple of quotations. So the first quotation comes from John Ippolito, who is, um, who, who is an artist and also works on preserving uh, net art, um, uh, variable media art, as he calls it. And he has this to say about, that gets at some of these questions. New media art can survive only by multiplying and mutating. Fixity is death. And Alan had, you know, mentioned actually fixity um, around the planet's data model in his talk. So this is a very, very different model of authenticity that John Ippolito is identifying. There was also a fascinating talk on digital preservation and evolutionary theory at the 2010 Digital Humanities Conference at, at King's College London, um, where the, uh, the authors were looking at the application of evolutionary theory to digital preservation. And among other things, they noted that um, this is Peter Dorn and Dirk uh, Ward, the ecology of longevity, the relevance of evolutionary theory for digital preservation. Keeping digital objects fixed and rigid is difficult, they say, yes. Migration as a preservation strategy. Adapting data to the environment, which is what migration is, is better from a biological perspective. The traditional method of preserving first, then reusing content is illogical and even perverse from an evolutionary perspective. Evolution gets rid of unused functions, better strategy is reuse than, than preserve. 
and copies should be free to evolve, make copies in evolvable forms. So I see actually what they're advocating as consistent with a lot of what the gamers do. Now the gamers are not a homogenous community, and there are some, some um, remarkable differences of opinion. For example, the folks behind the Software Preservation Society, they're all gamers, and they're actually the ones who created the Cryoflux, which I mentioned earl earlier. They have what I'd almost call a kind of um, fundamentalist attitude toward digital preservation. And they've actually created tools that let them read um, flux transitions in magnetic, magnetic media at very, very, very fine resolutions. And so they are all about extreme fidelity to the bitstream. So that's um, you know, a sort of corner of the community that thinks very differently. Um, I'm going to skip the, the stuff. Uh, okay, so, I, meant, so the, I mentioned the open archival information system and their model of authenticity. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, so I, first of all, it's, it's going to be hard to kind of condense the OIAS in, in a, one or two slides. Um, and, it, and it's always, whenever I see presentations on it, it's always incredibly tedious. Um, but this is, what it, this is my understanding of the OAS um, uh, a model. So it's, it is a framework, a widely accepted framework, um, developed by the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems back in 2002. I think it was when it was finally published. Um, but it's meant to be kind of content agnostic. So the fact that it originated with this community doesn't mean it, ha it isn't used by other communities. On the contrary, it's very, very widely adopted in the archival world. Um, so the, the framework uh, provides um, a, a sort of shared terminology and shared set of concepts um, for thinking about things associated with digital preservation. It basically um, spells out the different high-level functions and services um, that, uh, that a digital archiving system um, is responsible for and it characterizes some of the attributes of the information objects that are the focus of preservation in the system. Um, so uh, this is, you always see this in the slides. Um, it's not a implementation, it's not a blueprint for system design. It doesn't tell you anything directly about implementation of the system. Um, it's again a very abstract model. This is a diagram you often see of the OAS um, that spells out the different stakeholders. So um, on one side you see the producers who are the creators of the digital information that a repository is um, acquiring and ingesting. You've got the consumer, which is called generally a designated user community in OAIS terms. So before you undertake um, the project of um, ingesting your bits um, and figuring out what it is you're going to ingest or collect, um, you do an assessment of the designated user community. You decide who that is, and you assess their knowledge base, as they say, and you try to provide information or save information um, that, um, that is consistent with your understanding of their knowledge base. So generally, the broader you go with your user community, if you, if you say the, the general public is your designated user community, you're going to have to supply more information as part of your OAIS information package than you would otherwise. Uh, because you have to assume um, you know, you're really kind of uh, preserving um, to, the, to the lowest common denominator in that case. Um, and I'm going to be really focusing in on that, on that middle square in the diagram, the archival storage. And here we see just another version of that same diagram, but here we've added the information packages that move their way through the, OI, the OAIS, the, um, the digital archiving system. Um, this is, they have lovely terminology for this. There are three variants or flavors of the information package, the submission information package, the archival information package, and the dissemination information package. The AIP, or I think they call it APE, is that right? Um, is, is, uh, is what's um, preserved and maintained as part of the archival storage function of the OAIS. So that's the focus of the preservation efforts, is that APE, that archival information package. And here you see a model of what's in that package, so the structure of the information. Um, it includes uh, content information, um, the actual objects that are the focus of preservation, such as you know, a particular game, and also what's called representation information. 
So this is once representation information is what you need to maintain to ensure that your bit stream is intelligible and renderable over the long term. Otherwise, it's just a meaningless string of zeros and ones. So how do you decode that bit stream? So you've got to preserve the information to do that. That's your representation information. Um, in the case of, say, Mystery House, um, which, was, which ran on the Apple II system, you would want, for example, a copy of the Apple II DOS manual as part of your representation information. Um, now, this, now we get into the infinite regress because then if the, uh, if the, if the uh, DOS manual is, um, rend is, is in PDF format, then you also need to include as part of your representation information the specifications for the PDF format. And then if the uh, specifications for the PDF format reference other documents, then they need to be part of your representation network too. So this very quickly becomes this very bloated network. It's all about relationships, as Andy was saying earlier, and you're mapping those relationships within the OAIS model. Um, and I think, I mean, my understanding is that actually, theoretically or supposedly, your representation network ultimately has to end in an analog piece of information. It's actually got to you know, end with something physical in the real world. Um, I don't know if this is apocryphal. I think I've heard Jerry say this. Okay, but, oh, so actually, so another thing I want to point out here is the preservation description information in this AIP, this APE. So this includes provenance and fixity information. So now we're getting at authenticity. So the fixity information is, um, if, you know, it might include something like a checksum value, which is kind of like um, a digital uh, fingerprint. And um, so you'd run a check, you'd, you'd run a checksum program um, against your digital object, obtain your 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 number, and then at some later date you'd run it. You know you'd run the program again, and then you'd compare the two fingerprints. And assuming that there's no difference between them, you can assume that there's been no changes in your bit stream, that nothing's been tampered with, or that nothing's there's no bit rot or whatever. Um, so that's uh, so that's fixity information, making sure that your bits are stable over time. But then there's provenance information, which is documentation about the life, um, the life of the, uh, the artifact, the, the history of ownership, and the changes or transformations it's undergone. So it also records that information. So does the OIS model tolerate alteration of the preservation object? Yes, it does, but. Um, so there are definitely, the, the OAS model necessitates that you're thinking of two things simultaneously, preservation and access. You want to be able to provide access to that designated user community. So you're constantly balancing the tensions between preservation and access. Um, it might be necessary, for example, to migrate um, files to a more contemporary format um, to, that, that is compatible with your software and hardware systems. Um, uh, uh, you know, changing um, or delivering it to the end user in a different format. So, so delivering it, you know, in a JPEG format instead of a TIFF format or whatever. So all of this is documented as part of the provenance information. Um, but the, the basic idea of, uh, so even though it, it allows for some, for some change in this manner, um, you could say that in the OAS model, preservation um, uh, happens in spite of, not because of, these necessary changes that have to take place. And they're kept very minimal, and you try to do the least possible um, so that you're always preserving the integrity of those underlying bits. Okay, so we've got these two contrasting models. So as I said, I think one thing we can do is, um, it's fine for the two models to coexist, I'm not judging one model over the other. And in fact, um, the, the model adopted by a lot of gamers I think is very consistent with what we saw in the late 90s and early 2000s in the field of textual criticism, where it was all about the social text, and we valued the accretions and additions created by editors and so forth. Um, in some ways you're kind of seeing a similar type of model in the, among at least a lot of the gaming community, but not all of them. Um, but given that they uh, play such a prominent role in digital preservation, can we think about services that we might provide um, that support that model? Um, so um, this is just a quote from Jeremy John at the British Library. I mentioned him earlier, and he has this great white paper on personal digital archives. And uh, he, he has this to say, Jeremy John of the British Library has postulated that, quote, future researchers will be able to create phylogenetic networks of tr or trees 
from extant personal digital archives and to determine the likely composition of ancestral personal archives and the ancestral state of the personal digital objects themselves. So thinking about tools that we might provide that to the, these communities to kind of map um, and, and uh, visualize um, the interrelationships between the different versions of the games that emerge. So if we've got these version streams around objects, then this is something we could do. Um, you already see, do see the, the gamer community doing similar things. They create, for example, trees showing the different versions of Adventure, which is that game I mentioned earlier. It was created in 1975 by Will Crowther, um, revised, uh, the source code was released, it was revised by um, uh, Don Woods and a couple years later and the user community, the player community has continued to adapt and change it over time and they provide these kind of trees. This, this tree is actually based on um, several of those in the player community but was created um, anew by Jerry McDonough and Matt Kirschenbaum and published in Digital Humanities Quarterly a year or two ago. Um, but I want to provoke, uh, to close, I want to um, propose one other potential uh, approach to this, and this is very, it's still very unformed, um, but, and it's something I, I originally floated in our 2010 white paper um, that came out of this project, and you can actually just Google for Preserving Virtual Worlds final report. Um, and so let me just, this, is, this was inspired by my colleague in the iSchool, Jennifer Golbeck. Um, she works on, she studies trust relationships um, uh, in web-based social networks. So she actually um, designs algorithms um, to, to do this. And there's tremendous interest um, in, in, cert, in, in the uh, social network analysis world around trying to understand trust in online communities um, and develop, developing trust models, ways to detect trust, measure it, um, and so forth. And so Jen, I'm actually borrowing from Jen's dissertation and proposing this idea. She, she designed some algorithms um, to, to measure and detect trust and model it in some, some communities. So I'm thinking again about surrogates. Surrogates are proxies for what it is we really want to try to get at. So can we get at authenticity in a different kind of way? So digital preservation services calculating trust in fan-run game repositories. Because game archives in the wild cannot usually be authenticated according to standard integrity checks, an alternative method for evaluating the authenticity of their holdings might involve the application of trust-based information. Jennifer Goldbeck, for example, has demonstrated how the trust relationships expressed in web-based social networks can be calculated and used to develop end-user services, such as film recommendations and email filtering. Applying Goldbeck's insights, archivists could leverage the trust values in online game communities as the basis for judgments about the authority or utility or authenticity of relevant user-run repositories, such as abandonware sites, home of the underdogs, and game catalogs, uh, like Moby Games. Under this scenario, authenticity is a function of community trust in the content and the um, and the other individuals who are part of the community being provided. One consequence of this approach is that authenticity and mutability need not be considered mutually exclusive terms. On the contrary, fan-run game repositories that make provisions for transformational use of game assets, such as altering the appearance of avatars or inventory items, might in many instances increase trust ratings. So very counterintuitive, and it's a very different way of getting at the issue. And I'll just leave it there. Um, 
the uh, it, it also um, bears on the, the question that you asked, you know, in, in opening as to whether we're really talking about data modeling at all. And to that, I would say, well, you, you're in a sense you're not talking about data modeling in the sense that we've talked about it so far today, because you're talking about a, a model being a protocol, a set of rules, a set right, of definitions, a right. framework. Yeah. But nevertheless, you're 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 face up against all of the problems because you have the problem of dealing with the stack, which in which we have both explicit and implicit data models in the more concrete form, all built in. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, we haven't really gotten in so far to some of the other, you know, sort of metaphysical problem questions about what's the, what's the difference slash relationship between a serialization format and the model that it's in, that it expresses, or for that matter, not even a serialization format, but an implementation of a program or an algorithm versus the model that it expresses, yeah, right? Yeah. Those are all buried yeah, in right. all of these issues right. about how is it that we actually in, Encapsulate right. This thing. So, so the data model issues are more sort of subterranean. They're subterranean, yeah. but they're but they're but they're at the heart of it, right? Because if we can't actually know what those things are, then how do we expect this thing to to, to you know have any preservation at all? We I mean, even look at it, much less to run. Right. Right. Yeah. I was also thinking about um, um, Alan's talk too, in terms of like the issue of um, identity conditions, and I think you could sort of think about different communities having. Um, more more rigid or looser identity conditions in terms of how they approach the um, the similarity or the sameness between two or more objects. So it seems like you know many members of the game community adopt relatively loose identity conditions, or they operate kind of at the, to think about Ferber terms. They operate at the Ferber uh, work entity type level rather than like so. Okay, one additional point of contrast is that in OAIS. Um, as it's now implemented, uh, usually or customarily, um, there's really no such thing as like a duplicate of an object in the OIS model. So if you create a duplicate of a file, or if you migrate a file, um, but and let's say, let's just stick with a duplicate. You know, you've got you've got a duplicate that still has the same um, you know uh, bit stream uh, values as the original in OI, OAIS implementation. Those are considered two distinct objects. Um, the the one the second uh, the second dupe that is is um, not considered a variant of the original, um, but rather its own unique distinct object. Although you do preserve the relationship between them, which is a derivation relationship. But they're treated. There's no such you know. There's really no such things that thing as like two objects being the same. I don't think in the OIS model. There's a very interesting book by uh, Salvatore Setsis, uh, which is called The Future of the Classic. I don't know if there's an English word in it, so there's an Italian and German one. And um, that very much follows, or basically brings another example for your point, right, about the difference of preservation. And actually, so he, he says basically Europeans always, or the Western world, always focuses on like, depicting ruins to signify old age. Wow. While Chinese and uh, Asian people in general tend to um, to, to signify old age would say a really old tree. And ruins were actually something imported from the West. And um, if you look at preservation, a Japanese temple is still considered old even if there's no piece of wood which is older than 50 years because it's done in the same way as 500 oh, years ago. Oh, right. I've actually heard about that model of preservation where, um, if, uh, it, well, it's, it's, the, it's the, uh, the parable of Theseus's ship, right? Yeah, right. Isn't that what it is? Where where um, Theseus has a ship, and or is it is it Theseus? Yes, Theseus. Yeah, and yeah, and he and over time he has to keep replacing planks as they yeah. as they rot, and so at the end of the day, is you know, is the ship with completely replaced planks? Is it the same ship that he set sail with? Um, because structurally they're the same. Yeah. Um, but they, they maintain the Theseus ship in Athens. Okay. The, the shrine at Ise, every twenty years they rebuild it next to itself. It was completely new materials. Okay. It's been going on since the year 600 or so. Right. Um, and so every 20 years, it's just a different building. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. And I think the point is we, we don't need to. Uh, so, so basically, what, what we have in mind is we think about preservation as this reliquary kind of Catholic, right. Right. Catholic church kind of thing, right? Which is the rest, something which is not used anymore, which you just look at it. But if you look at other things like the Dome of Cologne, like the Church of Cologne, which is restored all the time, right? Because if you're ready in one end, you have to start at the other end because it rocks while it's <coughs> built, right? And I think 
So there, there may be examples all across the world where we can actually trace that and basically foot that somewhere, which maybe is a better argument. You know, because probably, as it looks right now, my hunch would be there's a better user base for gamers preserving games in Asia, Korea, Japan, and China than yeah. here. Is that yeah. true, or is there? Well, I, don't, I mean, that's a good question. I actually don't know. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, I, it's an open question. I was thinking of something I would ask later, but I can do it now. I, from, from what I heard that concerning also the, the OAI model and the previous talk with this discussion about prices, is that we're somehow, when discussing about data modeling, we need somehow to discuss about the kind of metadata model that we need to interpret what's going on in the evolution of information. Mm -hmm. um, we are constantly in this situation, and I mean, I call that surrogate in some of my talks, with a kind of generic view that every digital object we create at some point is surrogate or something. So the application is one operation, one right. possible operation. Or creating, creating a document, compiling annotations about um, natural code, Mona Lisa, is creating a kind of surrogate also for this object. And by really identifying what is specific to such a surrogate, authorship, time stamping, um, relation to possible sources yeah, in, right. in a kind of recursive way is necessary so that we, we can see those phenomena of, of preservation as also taking into account those evolutionary phenomena. And we're, we're probably missing this in, in, in the community as a whole. Yeah, I think the temporal dimension is really, really interesting. itself by William Gibson um, uh, so that if you ran it in your browser once it scrolled down your screen and then it encrypted itself and it was gone forever and so they the creators including Gibson actually had a good time uh, imagining what you know librarians would do and they actually had to you know create a finding aid for or whatever for one of these objects but okay so presence so how do you capture and preserve presence oh so I, I immediately think of someone again like Jonathan Lita who also works with this kind of art um, and I don't know, I, 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 he's created um, this new media art questionnaire, um, where, which he gives to new media artists um, uh, to fill out before their artwork is exhibited or acquired by a museum. Um, and it basically has the artist uh, go through and indicate which attributes or features are uh, absolutely necessary, necessary to preserve over time, and which ones are um, he or she is willing to sacrifice. So I imagine that that questionnaire probably captures some of those things, um, but I, I guess I'd have to think about like a concrete example um, in terms of some, how something like presence would play out. Yeah. Well, to add to that, um, the Agrippa project is a great example. I was lucky enough to be on that project, and the, the way That's that right. it managed to be archived is kind of with uh, yeah. people filming it right. <laughs> at the kitchen. Yeah. Right. It's fantastic, and we have it on the site. Um, but I was thinking about that in terms of um, the immediacy of the experience of gameplay itself. Mm -hmm. And so how might that be archived? Is there a possible cheat? And a possible cheat might be machine um, or um, something along those lines. Okay, and I that's great. Yeah. About that kind of thing. Right, okay so, okay, so generally as part of an OAIS, we also <laughs> preserve context information which is different from representation information, which is much more technical. The context information is of the other information you have to include in order to help um, a user at some time in the future make sense of and understand the significance of this particular piece of work. So in the case of um, uh, 
text, the text adventure game, Colossal Cave Adventure, be included. For example, Dennis Jers's article on the, on the game, um, he actually uh, went and explored the cave system in Kentucky um, that, the, that, the, that the game tried to model, and he kind of you know, mapped similarities and differences, and he traced the whole provenance and history of the game and so forth. So that, that article became part of it. So I imagine, I mean, I think you could sort of indirectly get at presence and things like that through, again, surrogate documentation. Um, there's, uh, well, there's also things like, my, my colleague Henry Lowood talks about this quite a bit, um, things like uh, game demos or certain genres of games like Doom, um, where you're not video recording gameplay, a game session, but rather there is a feature of the game engine that um, will, will capture a um, gameplay um, through a set of uh, instructions. Um, basically, it's like, um, it's basically documenting or notating um, it, you know, the inputs of the player. And then um, you need that same version of the game engine to play back that demo. Um, but again, it's not video recording, it's actually documenting or notating or um, uh, the, the, the input or the, um, uh, the input of the player um, as a set of instructions. Word for it is transaction, capturing the transaction. Oh, okay, that's what it is. Okay, yeah, so, so something like that. And, and mankind has done it for hundreds of years with, say, chess. <laughs> Actually, um, they, they're using traps and similar tools to capture what's on the screen. And there's a huge, a new sort of text called Let's Play, where people sitting at the front of the screen and they uh, comment themselves while they're playing. So they're not just recording the game, but they're recording what they're doing there at the moment mm -hmm. and how they're feeling. And so this could be an answer. Yeah, playthroughs and walkthroughs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All of this kind of layer of what has happened Right, right. Very exciting. There's an interesting kind of analogy to art history, right? Because art historians for a very long time, like if you think of like very famous books like the Cathedral by Sidney he, he basically studied them from the photographs. And that's what's going to happen with the history of video games if you go down that road. Right? Yeah. Because if never nobody ever had a competition pro five thousand shall I say for eight that's hours right. to play a certain game, he does not know how to that's right. Right, and it makes me think too of um, there. There was a practice in the Renaissance where Renaissance artists like Titian would try to reconstitute lost paintings of antiquity based on surviving verbal descriptions of them. Very good. <laughs> so I, I have a question about uh, your experience with the OAIS model. Mm -hmm. um, it's extraordinarily complex, mm -hmm. and I, I wonder if this is an example that is instructive in a negative kind of way. Because this is a conceptual model that is so complex that implementation of it in practice is almost impossible. Uh, and I don't think that's exactly an exaggeration. A Portico report uh, from 2001 uh, reported on trying to implement OAIS models at Cornell uh, for digital preservation. Mm -hmm. And discovered that a model that they call zip and hold, where you just zip up a bunch of files and get them onto spinning disks was actually a far more uh, reliable. <laughs> yeah. And one of the questions I have about OAIS is that, that I think is relevant to the discussion here is when is a, is a conceptual model an impediment to getting required work done? Because in the yes. cultural heritage community in, in particular, the OAIS model is so intimidating that people are letting their per portable hard drives, CDs and DVDs pile up because they don't have a solution that will perfectly implement the OAIS model. Right. We're losing cultural heritage because the preservation I, yeah. data modeling. I, I is absolutely so agree. No, I agree. I, wish, I actually wish Jerry McDonough were here because he he was really um, the lead on that part of the project. But we had a very small case set, so that's why it was feasible. Um, but again, I would point in contrast to the gaming community, where they're very, I don't know what the word, I'm not, I'm, I'm reaching for a word, it's not quite opportunistic, mm -hmm. but they'll do things like, you know, in the, in the early 90s when bandwidth was really awful, they would rip out, you know, certain, certain behaviors of the game, like the sound or some of the graphics and just upload what they were able to. Or in the case of Agrippa again, 
Um, the player community, or, or the, not the player community in this case, the, the community interested in the work of William Gibson, science fiction and so forth, or interested in new media art, um, they, uh, they simply circulated on that the 300 line poem, a transcript of the poem in plain ASCII text, that circulated for years, a, 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 you know, a poor fragment, a poor representation of what was originally this book artifact with a three and a half inch floppy kind of sitting in the middle of it and then you plug the floppy in and so forth. So, but because they floated the 300 line plain ASCII text for years, a decade, eventually researchers were aware of it and knew of it and had encountered it. So they at that point had the resources to go in and do something more sophisticated with it. So it's almost like however, however weak that signal we can send down the conductor of history, it can be amplified by you know, a later age. There's another example that goes in the same direction. Right? If you think about like, how much time and money public institutions have spent on like, building image databases in different fields, um, and then look at our, our store, for example, has 2 million objects. Facebook has 25 billion photographs. It's the largest image database on Earth. And if you look at people running through museums, right? If photogra photography is forbidden, they have to take, nevertheless take the picture and put it up, right? Right. And show it to their friends. Right. And I think um, that's, that's resources which are untapped outside of a few scientists who actually get access to the data and then they publish new papers, right? Because they can't really do the data. But I think that's, that's a very, very interesting point that that you make that basically all our models and all our setups are actually not um, not encouraging documentation. Yeah. They're actually inhibiting documentation. I mean, it's that, that old, you know, aphorism about the perfect being the enemy of the good or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two points in, in regard to the OAIS. You might take a look at something like Archive Nomadica, which is an open source uh, OAIS. Development. Have you seen it? And so, you know, of someone doing it from an archival point of view. And then the other would be uh, just to call attention to the Electronic Record Archive at the National Archives in the United States, which the initial development of that was in the hands of Lockheed Martin, and it was based on OAIS. And um, it's, it ran into a, a wide variety of things uh, that caused problems. Um, not the least of which is probably the fact that you have a large contractor, government contractor, are used to being paid large sums of money and not producing much, unfortunately. But the, uh, I was going to say about this. Oh, the, but the, the requirements within the context of national archives and government archives, and, and this is true around the world, is that you have things that are legally mandated in terms of, of the archiving of records and maintaining them over time. And so that adds an extra layer in uh, that has to be met. And of course, in a lot of cases, what's going to have to happen is you're going to have to go back and revisit the legislation that set it up to begin with. Because, for example, with, with the national uh, government in the United States, you, you had uh, transferral schedules that allowed a creative agency to keep their records for 15 years. In, in a digital environment, if that's electronic records, oh, yeah. 15 years <laughs> after the fact can make them yeah. a little difficult to... Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it gets really, really complicated. So, on one so hand, yes, it's complicated, but on the other hand, it's a complicated problem. So, the two examples that you gave me, those were, those were just flat out unsuccessful. No, 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 I would, you know, I do, do not want to be interpreted as saying that okay. the National Archives okay. is, 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 is <laughs> a member of the advisory committee. Okay. No, <laughs> let's, let's just say, you know, it, it's met a certain set of requirements, but it didn't 
it didn't realize everything that they wanted. And so, uh, you know, part of it uh, is, you know, over, over time it will have to be further developed. No, officially on the record, that's my position. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. We, Thank we got you. Both. I'm sorry to say that uh, our next speaker, Malte, is uh, isn't able to come, um, so this gives us more time to discuss with Gregor. Um, this presentation uh, will appear to some as a kind of a flashback um, in as much as a lot of it is um, the practical angle to what um, Wendell said in the um, keynote about mitral hierarchies. Um, my day today, I think this one is giving up. <laughs> okay. It seems like, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> um, what was I? Right, a flashback to Wendell's presentation, in as much as um, this one will also be about multiple hierarchies and markup problems. Um, my day to day work is um, a digital edition of um, Goethe's Faust. A genetic edition it is, and I'm a technical research assistant in this project. One of the main challenges of this genetic edition of Goethe's Faust is that we are trying to describe um, Goethe's text from multiple perspectives. Those are only five that I tried to represent um, in this diagram, but there are many, many more that we can think of. The two on the left-hand side, the document markup and textual markup, I'll talk about a little, little bit more detail in a, in a second. Um, but the general idea is that um, to deliver a really sincere um, edition of Goethe's Faust, we not only want to deliver a reading text or um, some um, story about how the text came into being, but we want to also describe things like metadata, for example, that we got from the archives where the handwritings and manuscripts are lying. Or we want to link the text to images, like for example, illustrations that we have for Goethe's Faust. And more importantly, we want to, want to deliver a very faithful um, um, description of the records that we find in the archives, namely the documents. So let me just take two of these perspectives, namely the document-oriented perspective and the textual perspective of our edition, and show you some of the challenges that we have in marking those up and representing them in our edition. In German editorial theory, um, when you deliver a historical critical or historisch kritische uh, edition, you are asked to make a clear distinction between what you find in the archive, the record on the one hand, the Befund, and your interpretation of that record, the Deutung, or what we could simply say, um, a clear constituted reading text. And the problem that we face um, structurally, um, I tried to draw up here, is that the reading text or the interpretation of what we find in the archives is more or less very regular. So everybody who has um, done some um, typography and, and text layout knows what's displayed on the right-hand side, namely the classical block-level, inline-level distinction of a text, that you have block-level elements that you can lay out vertically from top to bottom, and then you have inline-level elements, words, paragraphs, and all these things that line up from left to right or right to left, depending on what your writing direction is. So this is what you ultimately want to end up with. This is your textual perspective um, on the edition. What you see on the left-hand side, also a bit abstract, is a documentary view. And this doesn't adhere to this clear um, structure at all, or not necessarily adhere to this structure. Obviously, you also have certain zones or areas in the manuscript that you can um, subsume or subordinate to the textual idea of having a vertical and uh, horizontal layout. But then there are also other characteristics that you have to describe completely differently. So some areas line up in a certain way. Some textual sediments are grouped together spatially. Um, the writing direction changes, you can rotate text, for example. There are strike throughs and other artifacts that you want to represent that don't adhere to the textual order, but are more of a graphical nature. 
So, but both constitute or both describe in some way the same text. It's just that the one is more um, truthful or faithful to the manuscript, the record, and the other one has more resemblance of a text, the reading text. If you want to encode um, those phenomena, and here I take three perspectives, what you end up with as a data model is something resembling this and might look very familiar to you because it's a very um, common or well-known um, data model in market theory. I tried to uh, abstract away from a, a, an exact text and um, take a very simple text where you just have three lines that you want to describe from different perspectives. So on the left-hand side, what you see is a documentary perspective of that text. So you might have a text that um, is placed on your manuscript in two different zones. So let's say two lines, A and C, that are in the middle of the page. And then in the margin, let's say the right-hand margin, you have a third line, the line B, that comes to stand there. And if you want to describe that spatially, you could do it in a structure like, uh, like um, print it down on the left-hand side. Now you change the perspective of the text, and you say, now what I want to actually describe is the um, content structure of the text. Let's say it's a, it's a drama or a, a verse text. The order of the text, as well as the markup, um, changes. So what once stood on, in the margin, with line B, now comes to stand between the lines A and C, because it might have been an insertion done later on in the text. That might be the second perspective. And just to add to that complexity, you could have a third perspective that now looks at the chronology of the whole act and says, OK, A and C, then A and C have been written in the first stage. Second stage, then, was, there was line B written down. On the markup perspective, and that's the, the top layer, uh, you can encode this with XML without any problems. And the data model under, underlying this markup structure is a classical DOM model made up of knots and uh, connections that you see in the middle layer. And they are structured quite different, differently. The interesting thing, though, is that all these different structures refer to more or less the same text. So our lines A, B, and C don't really change, or only change slightly, depending on the perspective. What really changes is the structure or the interpretation of that text. This data model is, um, might um, seem familiar to you because it's a classical Godard structure that Michael Sperberg McQueen and Klaus Hütfeld developed um, quite some time ago by now in uh, digital humanity standards. The main problem with this data model is not so much that it's not well understood or that we would think of this data model as something completely unthinkable of in terms of text, but that it's really, really hard to um, use in a practical manner. So the question that we haven't really answered yet is how do you encode such a data model in a way that is really efficient to encode? How do you process it? So what means storage data, uh, storage mechanisms like databases, query language do you use to actually um, use such a data structure? Our first problem in the edition was to encode it. So how do you encode it? The TEI makes a couple of um, recommendations how you should encode such multiple hierarchy, uh, multiple, multiple hierarchies on, on a certain text. And all those propositions are very well thought up and um, have been applied multiple times in different um, editions. But they are basically workarounds. My impression was that when you read through these different uh, propositions, and I think it's yeah, chapter 20, you um, can solve that problem with some trade-offs. That's what, what a workaround is about. But my main question with it is, um, first of all, in, a, in addition that's really about multiple perspectives, what perspective should you actually choose as dominating one? So even if you subordinate different perspectives, let's say the documentary one or the genetic um, perspective, should the textual, really, textual perspective really be the one that dominates your encoding? And this is a wise decision, if all those different perspectives on the text actually should have their own right. And the second question that might be of specific um, relevance to this workshop is, aren't we just, just shifting complexity? So if we say on the encoding level, okay, we work around the deficiencies or the constraints of a specific data model, namely our tree-like data structures, aren't we just shifting the complexity to the processing end, where then we again have to deal with this problem in some way, which we don't see in the encoding, but then have on the processing level. So what we ended up with in the Faust edition was instead to um, do something that is also recommended by the TEI but not um, very, very popular among um, editors, we transcribed the text uh, several times. So every manuscript gets a um, uh, transcription from the documentary perspective and from the textual perspective. And then the question obviously remains, and that's the main reason why it's not very popular, how do you synchronize or how do you relate these different transcriptions of the same text? And what we turn to, and that's what I tried to allude to in the, in the title, um, what we did was we collated the text against each other. So 
take, take a, at first a look at it from a very schematic perspective. You have the same text, ABC, and that's first of all assume that it's really the same text. So same order of, uh, of the tokens or lines and no difference between um, the text. Then what you can see structurally is that the text ABC on the left-hand side has been marked up in a certain way. And the same text ABC has been marked up in a different way in different documents. So these are the two XML documents that I have at hand. So what I really need is a correlation between the elements in both transcriptions that are actually the same. So I want to have a correlation between the A's, the B's, and the C's, so that I end up as a result with a data model that's more complex than the isolated transcripts of my document. And interestingly, that's exactly what collation is doing. Automatic collation of text does nothing else than correlating things in a text that are the same to find out what's different. Or schematically, um, and a bit more from the perspective of collation, what it does, it does sequence alignment. On the left-hand side, you see a schematic um, collation result. Um, you have to read it from top to bottom. So you have the first text, which reads A, B, C, D, and then let's say a second text that reads A, C, D, B. And what sequence alignment algorithms do is they introduce gaps into those sequences, um, depicted by hyphens, so that the same um, tokens line up. So that, for example, we can see that the A actually is the same in two texts, or that the C occurs two times in the C. And what I also tried to, um, to show you is that um, you can actually detect things like um, tokens being moved around. So what you gain by applying collation to this problem is not only the nice effect that you can correlate things in the text that are the same, but you also get a certain kind of fuzziness or flexibility in terms of how you mark up your, your text. So in the Godard model, um, where you assume that the textual content is actually the same, so that you construct several data models or hierarchies or schemas over the same text. So this is a kind of constraint that you don't necessarily have to adhere to anymore if you apply collation to the problem. Because then all of a sudden, you could leave certain things out in one perspective. We have said in the Faust edition, for example, that when you have an archivist who writes down something on the manuscript, we would like to describe, transcribe that because it gives us hints about how this uh, manuscript was treated in a, in a certain way. So it's definitely part of the text from a documentary perspective. We obviously have to leave out that part of the text as soon as it comes to the reading text, the textual tra um, transcript of it, which is still, you can cope with it in some way with, with TI markup means, but with collation it becomes much easier because all that happens in the alignment of the text is that uh, this particular part is just left out and not aligned with, with something, uh, with some part in the different perspective. The other nice thing is that this whole problem of sequence alignment is actually a very well-known problem in computer science. So we can um, take uh, advantage of existing algorithms um, in bioinformatics, for example, or um, take advantage of existing solutions in, in textual collations for, for philologists to make that work. Um, I could show you a very short demo. Because collation is so crucial to our project, what we're actually doing is we contribute to a collation software that is currently in the works called Colidex. And there are obviously other solutions um, to that. I'm just showing this one as an example. And Colidex's um, main objective is not necessarily to develop a really good sequence alignment algorithm, although that's also one of its tasks. But what we really want to um, achieve is being able to collate any kind of text, be it a marked up text or a non marked up text, to actually achieve that kind of correlation. So what I can show you right now here in this demo is just the textual collation that you can hand in, let's say, three texts into that collator, and what it ends up with is um, a representation of the things in the text that are actually the same or that are different. Or you can get a tabular um, display of the differences and um, commonalities between the different texts. But the main point that I want to stress is you can do it automatically. So to correlate the two things, you don't necessarily have to read both texts and meticulously go word by word through it, but you can leave that task to a computer. And more so, if you can do it for XML documents or any markup document, you don't only get the correlations between the words. So your um, collator doesn't only say, chases appears three times in my manuscripts but it also tells you something about the markup context of this chases word, for example, in the different manuscripts. So you get the correlation. And that's what, what we do in the first edition. So we collate our different um, transcripts of the same text against each other and end up with an architecture uh, that resembles somewhat um, this architecture in, um, that you see on that slide. So instead of having a classical XML database that you would put behind a dynamic um, edition, what we actually have is a graph database. 
where all these different um, transcripts are stored, but are not stored as separate documents like you would have that in a, uh, in a normal XML document where you would have an XML document for the documentary transcript and one for the reading text, but um, they're actually uh, stored in the graph database and they're interconnected. So we color the edges and um, one um, color more or less resembles one particular schema or one way to tra um, transcribe the text. And what the collation um, algorithm uh, lets us do is that texts are only represented once in the database. So if you have a word or a verse, it's only one of those nodes in the database and it gets referred to by different schemas or different ways to describe that. And now the whole problem of switching views or switching representations between different uh, data models or, or schemas of the same text becomes a traversal problem in the graph database. So I, if I want to have the textual perspective on a text, I pull, let's say, the blue colored um, nodes, including the edges, out and um, push them to the browser to display. If I want to switch the perspective for a particular word in the edition, I take that nod, go back to the graph database and ask, so in what different um, colored hierarchies are, are, are you contained and switch that perspective um, to then show, let's say, a documentary perspective or a genetic one. The main problem with this approach is um, it's nice from a modeling perspective because that's what we wanted to have or wanted to kind of achieve for quite some time to have different perspective on texts and different hierarchies or multiple hierarchies, but it's computationally um, complex in as much as the reading of this um, structure or um, the querying of the structure works very well. Tra traversing such graphs is something that databases can do very fast by now. But what we have a problem with are graph updates. Every time we add a new perspective to the text, uh, we have to manipulate the existing one, depending on the granularity that, uh, with which we mark it up. So one knot, um, just imagine one knot represents a line, and all of a sudden, some linguist comes along and introduces part of speech tagging. And this line gets split up in multiple words. So we have to go to the database and then split up that one knot that constitutes one line into multiple words and introduce a hierarchy, which is computationally more expensive than a different um, aspect that um, Wendell um, proposed, namely um, ranges. Ranges are much nicer in as much as you can add them to a text independently. Um, of, the of the structure or the, the schema that has been applied to the text beforehand. So if you say the red line is one kind of markup or one structure uh, over my text, so A and B have some markup meaning, C, D, E have a different one, it's quite easy to add a blue or, or a green layer on top of that without interfering with the existing one. And, and, and querying is also much easier because those ranges work very well with relational databases and existing technology. So what we're currently doing, and I won't talk about that at length because Wendell has talked about it, uh, Quite, uh, quite long and um, much more sophisticated than I could do that. Uh, I won't talk about the liminal um, uh, model and the recursive markup thing and all these things. All I want to say is we have some practical problems with this uh, graph database model that you only come up with or that you only encounter when you actually implement the model instead of just uh, thinking about what would be a proper model of um, representing text uh, in a digital medium. So our preliminary conclusions out of that um, project and maybe with reference to, uh, to this data modeling um, workshop are threefold. So first of all, modeling text independent of a specific encoding or markup format and its specific data model, in this case a DOM, allows to cope better with their inherent complexity. Secondly, um, the combination of established encoding practices, so we still use a TI, uh, and the TI encoding standards to mark up our texts. It's just that we separate different ways of de um, describing the text in the different transcripts. The combination of established encoding practices and experimental computational approaches facilitates a gradual increase in complexity. So we can start out with one perspective and say what we describe right now is a text, but we can add a different perspective later on by just collating it and adding it to the existing kind, kind of model. So we have separation of concerns, which is a really um, neat f feature of a good data model that you can separate different concerns, different approaches to the text. And the last um, point is maybe a very simple one, but one that I would like to stress. Uh, modeling text is no different from modeling in other application domains in as much as it, takes, uh, it must take conceptual as well as computational aspects into account. Thank you. sentence because because you know there's like if you conceive of 
of gra things as graphs. And, and I think that's actually kind of something that comes up in the data modeling community. <laughs> like, I know we need a graph. Like, when things get complicated enough, you know, we go for that sort of most glorious of all data structures. And then when we go to process it, uh, we discover that it's, a, it's, it's the, the best way to destroy Java, you know, for example, Java virtual machine and so forth. So when you say computational aspects, I wonder which thing we're talking about. Are we, are we talking about computational tractability, which is, is at least philosophically possible for the most complex uh, cyclic graph you can name, or are we talking about the practical exigencies of the systems we have now? Because that second one sounds like something we might ignore. The first one sounds like, you, know, you, see, you see the distinction I'm making? I mean, there's, there's sort of, there's, there's uh, are we making things that are computationally tractable? That's one question. But the other is, are we making things that we can actually build and run easily? And that the programmers will kill us, right? And, you know, and I'm wondering which one is are you referring to in that sense? <laughs> because I heard both concerns. I mean, if you're a modeler, it sounds like you know we shouldn't we shouldn't pay so much attention to whether my existing server hardware can handle it or I have enough memory. And yet, in practical terms, of course, I have to worry about it. I think I'm referring more to the second part. Um, I mean, the main con risk of this project uh, to begin with was to go for the um, multiple uh, transcriptions of the same text. Because already in the, in the TI guidelines, it's put down that this is uh, one of the most sincere ways of um, describing or representing multiple hierarchies of a text. The only problem is that we don't know how to correlate the different views. And therefore, we basically erase that option, and then there comes a list of workarounds how to represent that. Um, and we had to develop this, uh, this collation approach over the project. So for us, it was, first of all, a practic practicability issue. So what can we do with the text? XML delivers for free not only encoding, but it delivers for free validation. It uh, delivers a transformation language, although not a very aesthetic one, at least in my opinion. And all um, infrastructure, uh, like databases. So do we really want to um, find a substitute for all these different offerings? Or is there an ability to gradually migrate it to something more complex? Yeah. I think uh, the, the graph, the, this, this kind of argument the grid, this graph structure is around since the 1960s, in a sense. But um, there is an exponentially, literally exponentially growing field since 10 years, which deals with graphs. And one interesting thing, if you, if you, you know, texts are one dimensional. But yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you compare them to say a set of architectural drawings, right, which uh, basically have say two sections to a building which cross, um, and then you have to do that kind of game. Where usually art historians used to do like hierarchical descriptions of, of, of a building, which usually are like you know main building, then floors, then rooms, and whatever. Then you have you have a hard time to actually fit that, right? It's a very very similar problem. And uh, you, could, you could basically think of it like texts which have knots in their string, right? So basically like genes, which are the strings which are knotted up. And then you have a hard time because the gaps will be huge. You have so many gaps that you can waste like a half your heart is on gaps, right? And, but nevertheless, you could actually use that graphs and actually do some network science on it and actually measure how bad or how good you do. So for example, in this case, if your description of the hierarchic building does not fit the structure of the documents. You can actually see by the distributions on both sides, by the probability distributions, how good your, your actual classification is. Because if it's really good, it will be an exponential, and if it's bad, it will be power. And so, so basically, these kinds of things are, it's, 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 a, it's an alley we think, I think we have to go down. We have to not only measure the data, come up with a nice data model of reality, but actually then measure that data model and then say, OK, how, how good are we doing? Is there better ways? What among all the possibilities are the best examples how to describe that particular thing? Right. I, I skipped one slide, because also there is some um, copyright issue, because this picture was actually drawn by Wendell in Amsterdam, I think. Um, you made that picture, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not from me, and I, I left out the credits, but I, I like this picture very much. It describes all the different um, theoretical approaches to multiple hierarchies and, and mock-up um, theory in a very spatial kind of way <laughs> at, the, at that time, right. 
at the time. And, and there you can see that the Godard um, kind of model, the graph-based model is in, in the middle somewhat, and the range-based model are down there. But these are two main ways of describing text. And each of them have certain computational features, uh, like I tried to explain in this very short presentation. So I'm, I'm not very sure whether, um, or let, let's put it that way, just because I can apply certain graph algorithms on graph-like structures doesn't necessarily mean that that's my main point of application for texts. I can see how if I have a graph representation of my markup, I can run these analysis, but the, um, the, the current challenges we had in the edition were much, much simpler. But basically, how do, are we able to write all these different tools evaluating this markup without constantly working around the milestone-based markup that the TI enforces on us? So it was a pure practicality issue. Um, added to that, um, Godard structures by now are expressed in all kinds of different formats. So there's an Italian project, for example, who tries to, which tries to express um, Godard structures with RDF. And while I don't see, really see the point in using this very verbose and um, kind of um, triple-based model to describe a Godard, they can show very well which applications they can use uh, on top of this, this model to, to make it work. It's just not, just not the representation I would use. Um, I'd like to um, uh, talk about Steve's objection about the uh, efficiency of the graph representation. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, and indeed, uh, when I first looked at this problem of representing a multi-version text as a, as a graph, uh, I came to exactly the same conclusion as you, that you could so easily slide into a situation where you're computing an NP-complete problem, uh, and it would never, ever work. So I discarded that, and I decided to use embedded markup, and I published that paper in uh, uh, Literary Interesting Computing 2006. Then I, had, I was shown a text by Domenico Fiormonte that was utter spaghetti. It was 10, 11 different uh, drafts, all written on the same piece of paper <coughs> of an Italian poem. And I realized there was no way with any amount of markup and attributes and links and so on that you could possibly ever represent that. And I tried for several months to do it, couldn't do it. So I went back to the model and I came to a different conclusion. If you constrain the graph, you can prove mathematically that you can compute it in a certain time and the, the French who worked on this, Medit Boudaillet, who worked on this, proved that you can do it in linear time. You can merge at least two versions. And when you have multiple versions, the worst is quadratic. You can get ON log N for the merging operation using a greedy algorithm. Now, it's true if you include the transpositions, the thing becomes NP complete. But if you have a heuristic algorithm, which gets a pretty good, pretty good fit, you can do it in very reasonable time. And I think also what he's talking, I was a little confused when uh, Gregor talked about the LMNLs in the same breath as the, the graph model. But I think if you separate the two and you use the standoff properties, which Wendell has described, uh, as a way of marking up the text in layers, separate from the versions, you've got a complete system <coughs> that doesn't use embedded markup. You've got the versions, you've got versions of markup, uh, and that gives you a very good representation, a flexible representation where you can have building blocks texts and versions to produce a, an output, which can also be efficient. You can process that Wendell's representation into uh, HTML quite efficiently. So I don't think the efficiency problem is, is a, a, a showstopper. A tree is a graph. A tree is an example of a graph that we've screwed with so we don't run into NP hard <laughs> problems. <laughs> I understand. No, I understand. I understand. But I think that's the interesting point, right? So there is this old kind of uh, argument that uh, if a graph is too large, you have to reduce it to a tree in order to draw it or forget about drawing. Right, and that's not true. That's his point. Yeah, and, and, and that kind of a notion, which actually is done by Ben Schneiderman, one of the most famous visualization guys in, in this kind of <laughs> Sarah's Park uh, review book from 1999, that is disproved constantly because the graph you can draw are growing larger and larger. Orders of magnitude per year, basically. And I think that's an interesting point. So I think, in terms of graph drawing and in terms of graph analysis, we are in the age of Chotto, mm -hmm. and we're still not at, you know, a Greco or something like yeah. that. There's still stuff to come. Um, one question, Chotto. Do you think um, what you're talking about is a data model on the level of how researchers or any other people from the humanities community think about the object? Or is it on a different level uh, I understand the data model includes computer science, but would be the logical level of the data model. And um, it, or is it is it a proposal to switch the view of how people in the humanities 
should think about their objects. Well, maybe you can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not very sure about that because the, um, the model I used, the Godard model, is, um, has been published in 92, 93? Or, no, it's, it's, it's no, not at all, right? It's 2000, 2000 something. 2003? I'm not quite sure. So, the paper is 2002. 2002. Oh. And the volume came out eventually. Yeah. 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 And so, so, the model is not a new invention or something that I, where I would say this is a technical uh, kind of perspective on things, but it seems the natural perspective of the humanists to think about things, multiple hierarchies addressing the same text. What, what I uh, thought of as striking is that it hasn't been implemented at that point. But that basically the workarounds are much more popular around the problem than actually finding an implementation for that very clean model of multiple hierarchies pointing the Which is a shame. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to change direction because I, I'm like soaking all of this up and learning a tremendous amount just from the inferences. But I do think that there's a, an issue that, uh, that uh, Gregor mentioned very briefly, which I think is really important. And I want to pose that as a question to you and, and to the rest of you guys who are, who are thinking about it, implementing this, which is um, having to do with, uh, with the, um, the design, the development process itself, and the workflow of the researcher who is actually investigating a text and working with it. And one of the things that you mentioned in, towards the end of the talk was that one of the things that XML in its current form gives us is that we can develop a schema and then distribute it, share, and that somebody who is coming into this new has some guidance, has some hints, has some right, a framework that's already in place, right? And one of the things that I think that has sort of always been working in the back of my mind is a question that I don't really know the answer to, which of course I spoke to this morning, but again, without any real, any, any concrete ideas about how this should work, is if, if you know if, if we do set aside this idea that this early commitment to the you know monolithic hierarchy is a necessary thing, and instead begin to do the things that we, we understand are necessary in order to do adequate representations of text, then what are we going to do on this on the side of uh, you know actually building a system which allows those points of entry and that progressive uh, you know permanent process of development that everybody has to go through. Um, you know, can we have schema languages that deal adequately with multiple hierarchies and arbitrary overlap, which even debates that? Hmm. I'm not an expert on, on um, schema languages, um, but the ones I know um, and that validate, let's say, the text that we use in the FOSS project are based on context-free grammars and on one single hierarchy that's validated. And um, so, put it another way, when I talked to Andreas Witt um, about that problem, um, and he also did a lot of research in, in, in this field, he said, if you want to have that substitute for XML as a technology, as a markup technology, you don't only have to find an encoding or um, a certain markup language, you have to uh, get the validation and the transformation language and the query language right in order to have a, have a full substitute. So just delivering um, an encoding that could possibly um, express multiple hierarchies is not enough because you don't get the um, syntax completion in XML editors, you don't get the validation part, um, all those things that we are used to by now when we edit texts. Um, my hope basically is that um, if that idea could be developed a bit further, uh, would be that this merging aspect of text would be more or less automatic, so that you would have something like a text repository or a database where you can ingest your, your texts or import them, and they might validate because they adhere to a single hierarchy, they are proper XML texts. But behind the scenes then, some um, collation algorithm kicks in and says, well, this text I have seen already, it's very similar to that other one. And then he connects the two and tells you, by the way, the, the markup you applied to your own text, to, to the one text you um, put into the system, has already been marked up um, to a certain part in a different <coughs> markup, markup system. Take a look at it, compare it. It's really a step. Did you mention which query language you use for query? And the other part of the question is, um, which <coughs> kind of people have queried this resource so far? Um, Except for you. <laughs> um, what kind of query language? So um, we we try two approaches. The first part, the first approach um, that we tried and that I showed you in this um, graphic here is based on a graph database called Neo4j. And so the, um, 
um, query model that we use for that graph is traversal. So there is no inherent query language. There are query languages for Neo4j, but what we basically do is traverse a graph with certain constraints, like what edges are, are we able to traverse, what, what order of the document, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that didn't perform very well, not because of the query. The query was actually quite fast. In normal PC hardware, you could traverse up to five million nodes per second. So that went, went very well. Um, the problem was the update. So what we actually use right now is this model, this range-based model. And there um, we use a custom query language that's uh, operating on this range model. And it's basically a translator from a custom uh, predicate-based first-order logic query language to a SQL. Um, regarding scalability, I think that's what your question relates to how many persons have queried that. Um, the Faust engine currently is not live, so we don't have many users, many par parallel users um, querying that repository. But the um, source code that we use to implement that model is currently in use um, in a different project in the USA. Um, it's about um, Collation, Juxter. I don't know whether you know that Collation software. And the upcoming version of Juxter 1.6, I think, will be web-based. So it will be a client-server solution where um, the whole collation is done on the server side and in parallel. So whether that scales, we'll see um, in one to two months because then this model basically will power the service. Go back to the the, the other slide. Uh, yes, this one. <coughs> Can you expound without boring these people out of their minds of a little bit? Explain to me a little bit the relation between the colors and the Godot structure. I'm not sure I follow. Okay. Um, the color base basically ex expresses um, one single hierarchy um, of, of nodes or one um, clear tree structure of a node. So the constraint is that one color basically constitutes a tree. So multiple parentage uh, in the Godot model means that one node has a parent relationship to two different uh, to two nodes with different colors. Could be the same model, could also be different nodes, but the main point is that the color is different. Okay, but in that case, it sounds more to me as though you have implemented multi cover trees uh, in the style of, of uh, the database community than the dog structures because uh, the dog structures. Well, I may be wrong. Uh, we should talk more later. Thank you. <laughs> More comments, like, uh, more comments, mm. uh, questions, especially. Well, are we with time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Julia. Uh, no, I'm putting my computer down in case there are no more uh, comments or questions, just for a few housekeeping notes. So. <laughs> yeah, but I thought it, it's a good point now to do the housekeeping. Thank you.